If you're here with us for the first time, I want you to know we're walking through the book of Exodus. And I encourage you to read back, if you haven't read that, any of that book, to back from the call of Moses, when the people went out of the land of Egypt with the ten plagues, and we just keep moving little by little. I hope today will be a great blessing to you. We've entitled the message today, Life, Problems, and Provisions. I also like to have a subtitle, Going Forward, but Thinking Backwards. Now you'll watch this take shape as we move along this morning, and we want to stand right now, would you? And I want to share some of these verses in Exodus 15 to give you a little picture of what's taking place. And... Uh, If you remember the story from last time, they had a great, glorious celebration of worship. In chapter 15, they had just crossed the Red Sea in Exodus 14 and made it through. And God did a miraculous thing. And now they had a great time of worshiping. But watch what happens in life. This is very much a picture. And I believe today that all of us will see ourselves in some shape or form with the problems of Israel. Let's follow these scriptures, Exodus 15, 22 through 24, first of all. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, then went out into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter, Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Chapter 16. Now they move on to another place called, place called Elam, out in the wilderness. Verse 2. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then said the Lord unto Moses, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they walk in my law or not. Verse 13. Exodus 16, 13. It came to pass that even the, at evening the quails came up and covered the camp and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew lay was... And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as a hoarfrost, on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, It is manna. For they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. 21 and 22. And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating, and when the sun waxed hot, it melted. And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two almers for one man. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. 35. Verse 35. And the children of Israel did eat manna forty years. Until they came to a land inhabited, they did eat manna until they came unto the borders of the land of Canaan. May God bless this word, you may be seated. Life, problems, and provisions. The God of miracles had done it again. He'd broken the chains of Israel from the slave camps of Egypt. He made a right of way right down the middle of the Red Sea to the other side. He sent that powerful east wind, you remember, to sweep down and burn the water of the Red Sea dry. 
He exchanged slushy mud for drifting dust. When they came out of the sea onto the dry land on the other side, they turned back and looked. And there the waters. The Lord let the waters come back and destroy all the Egyptians and their armies. Chapter 15, they had a great time of worship. They sang this new song of victory and redemption. But Moses knew that the Lord God was leading them to a new land, a promised land. That's what he promised his forefathers. Go to the land of Canaan, my promised land. But on the journey of life, we know that it's not a bed of roses. If your life has been always smooth and straight, stand up and say amen. I don't think we have any takers, do we? Because on the journey of life, you're going to go around some bends. You're going to go around some mighty curves. You're going to have to go up some mighty hills. Or walk through some dark valleys. That's life. There'll be high moments and low moments. There'll be triumphs and tragedies. Yes, we can sing when the circumstances are calm. But what about when the seas get rough? It's going to take a faith. A deep faith, a courageous faith, a spirit-led faith, a Christ-honoring faith to see us through. Well, first of all today, we're going to journey on two roads today. First, it's called the grumble road. No one here ever grumbles and moans, do you? Well, in this journey to the promised land, they got sidetracked and detoured on the grumble road. I want to say, first of all, we're presented with a problem that's contagious. It's catchy. You can contact it. You come into contact with it. I don't know if you've been paying any attention this past week about the Ebola, this bacteria uh, that it can spread and, and destroy and kill a life. We hear of TB. I heard this past week also someone is coming to America with a certain strain of tuberculosis that nothing, no antibiotic, no kind of medicine can touch it. It's caught. It's catching. It's contagious. Well, what about murmuring, grumbling, complaining? You got everybody catching that disease today? Look at verse... Uh, 22 for a moment. They went out of the wilderness, and how many days was it? Now, I just told you they had a glorious time of worship on the other side of the Red Sea. How many days did the Bible say in verse 22? Three days. They couldn't find some water, so boy, they started getting on Moses. I'm telling you, we're going to rake him over. Let's listen to him for a moment. Here's one. Yep, I told you Mr. Moses, Moses was a cool guy. He's taking us out here to wander in this dust, in this blistering hot sun, and we're thirsty. And the next one says, yeah, that's right, we're going to thirst to death. And the group gets together and he said, look, we found some water over here. They taste it, it's bitter. They call it mara. It's nasty. But we know that the Lord sent them through that test to provide some good water for them. As we find at the end of that chapter 15, he sent them to Elam. They didn't find one well, but how many wells did they find in verse 27? Twelve wells of water. Well, this contagious problem continued in verse 2 of chapter 16. Now, watch, watch this contagious Happening. What does it say in verse 2? And the whole congregation of Israel. There's whole thousands, hundreds and thousands are getting cranked up. Murmuring, complaining to Moses. Let me share something with you today. May I? A germ that spreads through the whole crowd. It's like associating with the wrong crowd. You know what happens when you get close to the wrong crowd? You know what happens, don't you? 
You catch what they got. You just begin to touch and attach yourself to them. You see. So it is in the murmuring and in the, the grumbling. I found a song that's very interesting this week. You know what the title of it is? Grumblers. I guess I found it for me, really. It's written by Thoreau Harris. Listen, it says, In the country, town, or city, some people can be found who spend their lives in grumbling at everything around. Oh yes, they always grumble no matter what we say, for those are chronic crumbler, grumblers. They grumble night and day. And then it goes on to the part about neighbors, husbands, wives, children. And it continues. They grumble when it's raining, they grumble when it's day. And if the crops are failing, they grumble and they say. Oh, they grumble on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. They grumble on Thursday too. Grumble on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They grumble the whole week through. So, are you like that? Are we like that today? We need to be careful. It's a contagious problem uh, for the Israelites and for us. Secondly today, on this grumble road, it becomes a problem of our focus. A problem of our focus. Now look at chapter 16 and verse 3. Let's imagine that we're some of the people there. Moses and Aaron, it's time for us to look backwards. See that part I told you about in the subtitle, Thinking Backwards? Look what we had down in the land of where? Egypt. You see that in verse 3? Let's go back down to the land of Egypt. Well, we remember that good meat we set over beside those nice pots and they were cooking and steaming. We had some good bread also to eat. Now think of this. Out here in no man's land, in the wilderness, in the desert, left here to thirst and hunger, and now they're saying we're going to die, Moses. Moses, you're looking ahead for a promised land. We're ready to look back to the provision of Egypt. You know, isn't it a sad thing to be on the road to freedom and turn back to slavery? There's some of you here today, unless you know Jesus Christ, and we're going to get to Jesus at the end today, unless you know Him, He's provided a way out for you to get you free from the bondage and the power of sin and death in your life. And if you don't know Him, you need Him. Well, listen, back to Israel. They watched the hand of Almighty God. They watched the power of the cloud. Remember we talked about that? The cloud by day, the fire by night. When it moved, they moved. Everything was going well. God said, this is for you. I have it ready for you. They wanted to go backwards to Pharaoh's hand who ordered the beatings and the burdens. Make the bricks out of the straw. You stir up the mud. Do it yourself. And they died and they sweated and they had pain. But no, we want to go back. Friends, I'll tell you one thing. Why would you want to turn back from a righteous Lord to a pagan king? Now, that doesn't make sense, does it? You've got to keep your eyes focused on the promised land, not the unpromised land, the dark land of Egypt. It's a recipe for failure and it never work. Freedom with the Lord and His people or bondage with Pharaoh in Egypt, why would you do it? One pastor said, they claim they want the call of wings that is lifted by the wings of God to new heights. But no, they want to go back to the call of chains. Bondage. Chain as slaves in the land of Egypt. Friends, I think it's time to get up today and focus on the Lord's path. Do you want victory or not? Or do you want defeat? Which way are you going? It's one way or the other. Go God's way or your way. Or Egypt's way. There are times we grumble in life. Let's think here a minute about, a minute about the church. This is a very interesting application here. How many times do we grumble and complain because we're living in the past? Like Israel, oh, these were things used to be, used to have, used to do. I think I shared a little bit from Brother Ben Prophet, our director of missions, back 
many months ago, I don't know, maybe last year, he wrote a little article some years ago called Eusta People. U-S-T-A. Eusta People. That's a very interesting English word, isn't it? We used to have the largest Sunday school. Used to have the highest enrollment. Used to have the largest crowds. Used to have the greatest uh, young adult ministry. Used to have the greatest youth ministry. Used to be this. Used to be that. Well, when is used to? When is used to be? Isn't that past? The question strikes a major chord today, like Israel. How can the church go forward when you're going and thinking and looking backwards? How can you do that? Does it work? It can never work. It can't work in your life, in your home life, in your work life, in your school life. When you're going forward in a certain direction, you're always looking back, wanting to go back. It doesn't work. You've got to change your focus. Problems with our focus, our perception. Why don't we come like Brother Paul said to the Roman Christians in Romans 12 too. Be ye transformed by what? Now say these three words with me. Ready? Renewing. Say that word. Renewing your mind. Say those three words. Renewing your mind. To prove that which is good and acceptable, perfect will of God. He transforms the mind. Gives us a new mind. Israel was looking back to the old appetite mind. Old place of Egypt and the Pharaoh. It was high time to focus, get out of their focus problem and get on a new appetite and head for a new place. Grasp a new promise. Friends, today... I'm going to focus on the greatness of God, not the smallness of man. You think about that. If you get your eyes on what you do, what everyone else is doing, you're going to be bound with that great problem of focus of life. Don't give up. There's a beautiful promised land ahead in Canaan, but there's an ugly dark land back down in Egypt. That's why the Lord came in the first place. He says, Israel, sent Moses here to bring you out, Exodus, out of the land of Egypt. That's why our God gave up His Son Jesus. He came down. He sent Him to get us out of our old appetite, old ways, old sin nature. Give us a new nature, a new nature of righteousness, a new love, a new heart, a new life. How's your focus? You have a great problem today on the road of Grumbling, the grumble road also has a problem with gratitude. Thanks. That's the third thing today on the grumble road. Israel had to struggle. No water for a while, but God gave it later. There's in that chapter 15. He said, cut the tree down. He threw it in the water. It became sweet water. And then in verse 26 of chapter 15, I am the Lord that healeth thee, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals thee. So the Lord provided a way there. But on the journey of life, there are times of pleasure and prosperity, times of pain and adversity. Follow this story about the man who was tempted to complain about his situation of life. He said, two weeks ago, my TV went on the blink. Then my dryer went out. Then the lawnmower broke down. I said to the Lord, why me, Lord? Why does this happen to me? You know my finances. Then he began to pause. And remember how the Lord blessed him. Instead of complaining, he started to change his mind. And his heart looked heavenward. He said, Lord, how is it, or what is it that I've done so great that you would even desire to bless my life? Look, I've got a car. I can get a TV. I've got a dryer. I can work on the lawnmower. Well, then he began to think about where he was born and Why did you allow me to be born here in America? We have so much. Why wouldn't you let me be born in a poverty-stricken area of the world? See, his gratitude, his attitude of thanks started changing. Then he said this, When I think of all the ways the Lord has blessed me, though I didn't deserve it, I wonder why I complain about the relatively insignificant things that go wrong from time to time. If I could only learn Count 
my blessings. Say those three words, will you? Count my blessings. Are you doing that today? Like Israel, we need to get off the grumble road onto the thankful road of gratitude. Let's move now from on the journey of life here. The Lord's preparing a provision road. A provision road. This is our second major road we're traveling today. In chapter 16, verses 4 through 12, the provision road leads us to a test. A test. The Lord had heard the murmurs, the grumbles. Hey, Moses, we're out here starving. Really, they were complaining to God. Wonder why God didn't just leave them there. Why didn't he just withdraw from them? You know, he called his friend Moses. What does it say in verse 4? Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven. Then they'll know who I am. And he's going to prove them though. He's going to tell them what to do about getting it each day, gathering it. A daily gift of bread, the manna. It would be a test of obedience. Let me ask you a question here. Have you considered where you are on the journey of life? God may be ready to provide something very special for you. But you know what He's going to require? A test, a proving ground to see if you're really going to follow Him. Moses and Aaron were caught in the crossfires of the people. They began to say, what are, what are you grumbling against us for? We're just fellow humans. We're just trying to follow God's way. God's heard you. You will know what He's going to do in just a little while. You will see His glory. He'll show forth His presence and power. But no, you're grumbling against me, Moses said. Could God be stepping on our heels today as a church? Does God like our griping? Complaining, being fault-finding Christians in His church? How many are in churches today murmuring? Murmur about the pastor. Murmur about a deacon. Murmur about a Sunday school class. Murmur about this. Complain about that. It's quite interesting, isn't it? How the Lord meets, met their need of hunger. He brought them another test. Check our life situations for a moment. We find ourselves in the middle of a problem. God opens up the door, makes a way, provides a way out. We accept the answer. He says, follow this direction. Then He introduces a new set of tests. I, I love that little song that says, God will make a way when there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to His side with love and strength for each new day. He will make a way. God will make a way for His people. Sometimes He puts out the test. He wants to prove us. Let's see if we'll follow him. Well, on Provision Road, it also leads to a timing. There's a timing. Verses 13 through 25, we didn't read all these verses. Let me just point out some things for you. In verses 13 through 15, he provides the quail in the evening, the manna in the morning. What was this manna? Manna is the word that means what is it? In verse 15, he says, the bread the Lord's given you. In Psalm 78, it says that manna is called angel food. I thought that was very interesting. Every morning, the angels would bring down the heavenly food and put it out before them. God had a special timing and with His gracious provision. What about your life? It's a picture of God's grasp of salvation for us. He sent His Son, Jesus, but at the right time, the right place, just for you and me. Sent Him to the cross just at the right time. He arose from the grave the third day just at the right time. It's a glorious day. You heard the song. A glorious day. He came, he lived, died, rose again. Now, did Israel have to work for the manna? They're providing their food. No. 
They just had to prepare to eat it. They didn't earn it. Just come and eat it. But they still didn't appreciate it. In Exodus 16.31, it says it looked like white coriander seed. Now, I, I didn't search that out to see what a coriander seed was. But then it said it tasted like wafers made with honey. I guess that's a pretty good picture, isn't it? Seems like a good taste. You might ask today, I thought about this. I wonder if it's healthy. How healthy was man? Now listen carefully. A medical missionary served in the Orient. That's in the Far East. An improper diet always caused foot swelling. He noticed that among the people. Israel, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 8, 4, they wandered 40 years and their feet did not swell. Think of that. 40 years, feet never swelled, so apparently the manna must have had the right kind of vitamins and minerals so they could make. Ain't God a great provider? That's what He did. He did it for them. It was adequate to meet their needs. Did you ever think how much God provided when He sent down the bread? Now, verse 16, notice this. Chapter 16, 16, very interesting here. It's called an omer. For every man, according to the number of their family. Verse 22, on the sixth day, they gathered two times the amount for each one, so they rested on the Sabbath. Now think of the estimate and total number of Israelites came out of Egypt. Now it's about two million. Are you with me? Watch your math here. And Omer was about six pints. What is two million times six pints? Twelve million pints of the breed. One for every two million people. It says here it added about 9,000 pounds, 45 tons. What if you could put a train with 30 cars, line it up across the fields, across the landscape. Each car, each train car carried 30, I mean 15 tons, so 15 times 30, 4,500. Is that right? What a site needed for a day's supply of bread. That's just, that's just remarkable, isn't it? What a miraculous provision by the Holy God. The Lord provided for Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joseph. And he'll provide for us. Now thirdly today under this section about provision road, I want you to see it takes us straight to Jesus. To Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, I hope you'll open there with me to John chapter 6. John 6. Jesus has just been talking about the miracle of the 5,000. He provided, you remember, He looked up to heaven, broke the five loaves, two fishes. And notice what Jesus switches the picture from the physical bread to the spiritual. John 6 and 31. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. We've just been talking about that, you remember, in Exodus. As it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is He which cometh down from heaven, giveth life into the world. Then said they unto Him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, will you say this with me? I am the bread of life. Say that, that phrase with me. I am the bread of life. And he that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that you shall all, that you also have seen me and believe not. Friends, as we think about Israel and the manna, that's old bread. The manna came only to Israel. You understand? Stay with me here. It's very important. The manna came only to Israel and it sustained only physical life. 
the physical bread. The Jews had to appropriate it. They had to take it in. They had to eat of that bread or they would die. Look now to Jesus. Jesus said, folks, he's out on that hillside. You know, they fed the 5,000 people. Wow, this is glorious. This is great. They're going to turn Jesus into a bread king. He said, I didn't come for that. I came out of heaven to give you the bread from heaven. True life. Eternal life. Spiritual life. It's going to last forever. It's the new bread. It's living bread. I came for the world. He's the only one that can give eternal life. He's our eternal provision. That's why you better follow His road straight to Him. Well, where does it lead us? The Bible says all have sinned. On our road of life, all have sinned. Romans 3.23. We're separated from God. We cannot become into the relationship with a holy, perfect God. No way. But then he said in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you know Him? What did He do? He went to the cross. He died on the cross. Shed His own blood. To forgive our sins and give us true eternal life. We have to appropriate it. Take it. Eat of the bread of life from heaven. Let me ask you a stirring question. Are you on the road that leads to life in heaven or are you on the road that leads to death and hell? Now that's a question. A very plain question. One way or another. Which way are you going? He's provided the way. He goes straight to Jesus, His Son. Let's bow our heads, would we? As we hear this invitation, would you listen carefully? Father God, we know on the journey of life, just like the Israelites, we complain, we grumble, we have many problems. But oh God, would you help us to see, just as you provide for them, you want to provide for us. We have to follow the test, the proving ground. Are we going to believe you? and obey you. Now, Father, we've come straight to Jesus and we see Him on the cross. Is there someone here today, some couple, some individual, some family who needs to turn to Jesus Christ and partake, believe, and receive the gift of that true bread, living bread from heaven, yourself, and trust your cross for the forgiveness of sin. That you died, were buried, and arose again to live forever. And so we can live. God, would your Holy Spirit begin to work and convict someone's life even now. And help them to come and stand for Jesus Christ today. Father, there may be someone here today who needs to come into your church. They believe in Christ, even were baptized maybe but they're not following Jesus through His church. Help them to come be a part of His church family, His body, the body of Christ. Then, Lord, you may work in someone's life right where they're sitting right now. We want you to do your will. Help them to trust you and love you. In your wonderful name, amen.